There is nothing more tantalizing to the human species than a good mystery. Thrillers in the forms of novels, movies, and even campfire tales are often consumed by the thousands who love the adrenaline rush of solving a mystery. However, some of the most pervasive mysteries are those that occur in real life, and these are the ones that are often most difficult to solve. So today, here at Unexplained Mysteries, we'll be taking a look at mysterious discoveries. Drone finds a lost tomb with 72 ancient skeletons. On Canary Island, a drone has found a lost tomb with about 72 ancient skeletons. The tomb contains the remains of ancient people thought to be from a probably lost pre-Hispanic civilization. It was discovered by a group of amateur archaeologists around the holiday island of Gran Canaria. These mummified remains belonged to natives of the Guanche society. The discovery was made possible through the use of a drone. The drone was deployed by a team of researchers who are members of the amateur archaeology group called El Legado. This group was formed by Ayozi Himar Gonzalez, John A. Garcia and Jesus Diaz. This team of archaeologists deployed their drones on a research mission, which somehow and unexpectedly led to the discovery of the cave through the drones. Gonzalez, one of the members of the team, described how they were able to make this discovery. He said, We were flying a drone and we took some pictures of the cave. It is in a very difficult place to access, and you need to climb a cliff to reach the site. People thought the photos were fake because of all the bones there. This amazing discovery at the island of Gran Canaria consisted of 62 adult skeletons and 10 newborns. They were discovered in a ravine on the island, which is part of the Spanish Canary Islands. Archaeologists confirmed this discovery and have tried to link them to the Guanche civilization. They have also tried to date these ancient remains and were able to date them back to between 800 and 1000 AD. The ancient people of Guanche were believed to be the original inhabitants of the Canary Islands, and it is believed that the people of Guanche migrated from North Africa. Many historians believe that the people of Guanche were accepted into the Spanish society, who later integrated them both ethnically and culturally into the Spanish settlement. This was after they settled and colonized small islands. One of the archaeologists supervising the discovery, Veronica Alberto, told local media the following. There are many burial caves in Gran Canaria, but not many like this one. The discovery of the newborn remains is important as they were not included in previous findings until very recently. We now know they can be found in these types of cave burials. Archaeologists subsequently went down to the burial site and discovered traditional burial shrouds that were made partly from some vegetable fibers and some animal skins. Alberto further added that we can confirm that all the pre-Hispanic people in the Canary Islands were prepared the same way for the burial ceremony. Archaeologists dug as far as 75 feet below sea level to reach the tomb, only to discover more than five dozen skeletal remains that have now been analyzed and studied. The cave was discovered back in June 2019, but they did not make any report about it, because they feared if they reported it, the facility might be vandalized. But one year after the discovery, they announced to the general public that they had begun work on the site. Gonzalez further explained that the cave should be closed off and preserved with the bones left there to respect the site. We decided to report it because we want the local authorities to preserve and respect it. Hidden Rooms in the Great Pyramid Almost 4,500 years ago, between 2,509 BC and 2,483 BC, the Pharaoh Khufu was ruler of ancient Egypt. During this time, Pharaoh Khufu ordered the creation of the Great Pyramid, a monumental display of power. Built completely for himself, the pyramid itself has more than a 13-acre base and originally had a 479-foot-tall peak. The construction of the Great Pyramid is astonishing. Over 2.3 million blocks of limestone were quarried, cut to specific measurements and then placed into the formation we know today. The Great Pyramid is regarded as one of the wonders of the ancient world. 
In 2017, scientists studying the pyramid announced that they had found a previously unknown void inside of the pyramid that's estimated to be around 30 meters long. The last time any kind of big structure inside the pyramid was discovered was in the 1800s. This new void was found using a process called muon radiography. This method utilizes cosmic rays to locate voids or cavities inside of structures. This new discovery is being compared to the previously discovered Grand Gallery of the Pyramid. The Grand Gallery is a 150-foot-long corridor that goes directly to the burial room of Khufu, the pharaoh that commissioned this marvel of the ancient world. This corridor is also around 26 feet tall and sits below the newly discovered area. Still, it is completely unknown what or if anything lies within this area and what it was used for. It could be several smaller rooms or one large area we simply do not know. This discovery is still huge. It brings us closer to finally being able to understand and even just know the various intricacies of this truly astonishing structure. This discovery was made by the Scan Pyramids Project working with the Egyptian Ministry of Antiquities and is widely regarded as the most impressive achievement of the technique used to find it. We know this large void exists, but we really know nothing else about it. Hopefully, it will potentially validate any ideas of exploring the Great Pyramid further and hopefully understanding it better. Maybe further exploration will uncover more secrets. Thermal Mystery of the Great Pyramid The Great Pyramid or Great Pyramid of Giza is home to many mysteries. Because of this, many researchers, scientists and archaeologists are constantly examining and studying it. Before our previously mentioned discovery in 2017, there was a whole series of studies going on, but in 2015, whilst conducting thermal examinations of the Great Pyramid, researchers discovered that three stones located at the bottom of the pyramid were a higher temperature than any of the others. Whilst this discovery itself is truly puzzling, it could be the result of a variety of different factors, from differing air currents inside the pyramid, even more small undiscovered areas, or perhaps an anomalous building material which could indicate repairs or strength carried out thousands of years ago. The team of scientists and researchers came from around the globe to carry out these thermal tests. The tests themselves are just as interesting, as they would examine and carry out testing during different times of the day to test different theories. The morning around sunrise was a specific time the researchers would carry out scans whilst the sun was beaming onto the limestone blocks and heating them up. They would then carry out the same scans but in the evening around sunset once the same limestone blocks were cooling down. They continued these tests until they found the aforementioned anomaly of the three limestone blocks in particular that would display a difference of around 6 degrees compared to the rest of the block which would at most show a temperature difference of around 0.1 to 0.5 degrees between sunrise and sunset. This difference in temperature is quite puzzling when compared to the minimal difference of the rest. These affected blocks in question were located on the east side of the pyramid. This could well have something to do with why they are anomalies, but for now this remains a mystery. Salyut Seven Angels In July of 1984, cosmonauts on the Soviet space station Salyut 7 reported seeing a strange orange light. The space station was suddenly surrounded by the light, and it even came through the walls of the station. The light was so bright, the crew temporarily went blind. Once they regained their vision, they looked through the portholes for the source of the orange light. They thought there may have been an explosion somewhere since the Salyut 7 had experienced fires and other types of emergencies already, but they found nothing of the sort. Instead, the cosmonauts claimed to have seen seven angels floating around right outside the station. They said the angels looked similar to humans, but with wings and halos. The angels stayed close to the space station for another 10 minutes, then they disappeared. Twelve days later, a team from the Soyuz T-12 spacecraft joined the Salyut 7 crew. Just a short time later, they saw the same orange light. The light surrounded the space station, and they saw the angels outside again. This time, the crew said that the angels were as big as an airliner. The Soviet Union decided that this discovery should remain top secret, and they ordered the crew not to tell anyone what they saw. Some tried to dismiss these claims by saying that the crew were hallucinating. 
After all, they had been in the space station for 155 days when they first saw the angels, so they were stressed and probably exhausted. Some believe hallucinations could have also been caused by a lack of oxygen and pressure fluctuations. But how could they all have the same hallucinations? This also doesn't explain how the second crew saw the angels since they hadn't been there long. It has also been suggested that similar sightings have been secretly reported by many other Russian cosmonauts as well. The Origins of Human Beings Religion versus science is a never-ending debate when it comes to the topic of the creation of life on Earth. Ancient civilizations did not have the same concept of religion as we do in the modern day, but they did have gods and divine theories of creation. The Sumerians were spiritual people, and whilst much of their civilization was based upon never-before-seen advances in human society, they did believe strongly in the all-being and all-seeing. In fact, the Sumerians split themselves into cities, each guarded by a god, of which they had many. The Sumerian myth of the creation of the world, referred to at the time as the Enuma Elish, refers to human gods ruling the earth as it began. They did the labor that was required to make the world suitable for human civilization, such as mining minerals and cultivating the soil. The tablet upon which the myth is inscribed was discovered in 1849 by English archaeologist Austin Henry Lanyard. It lay in the ruins of the Library of Ashurbanipal, which was located in northern Iraq, thought to be part of the area of the Middle East that Sumerian civilization grew from. The first lines on the tablet alluded to the idea of the gods ruling and that they would cultivate the earth, saying, When in the height heaven was not named and the earth beneath did not yet bear a name, and the primeval Apsu who begat them, and Chaos, Tiamat, the mother of them both, their waters were mingled together, and no field was formed, no marsh was to be seen, when of the gods none had been called into being, and none bore a name, and no destinies were ordained. Then were created the gods in the midst of heaven. Lamu and Lahamu, were called into being. But the tablet explains that the gods quickly grew tired of their labor, and Anu, the god of the gods, decided that they needed a hand. They then created man to labor for them by sacrificing a good and mixing his blood with clay. This is an idea that the Sumerians believed in devoutly, as they truly viewed themselves as slaves to the gods. The Sumerian myth then draws parallels with Christianity, saying that the first man was created in Eden. This was the garden referred to in the Epic of Gilgamesh that was home to the gods. However, some of the gods realized that humans could not reproduce and thus gave them the ability to do so. But this did not go down well between the gods and a conflict ensued between them. Scholars point to similarities between this story and that of Adam and Eve, but it's not been verified as to whether this served as a basis for the Christian story. As such, the intrigue surrounding the creation of life goes on. The federal government will put you up in this haunted ghost town, if you dare. One town tucked away in Montana attracts a diverse audience, from the avid historian to the bored summer tourist and fans of the paranormal alike. Garnet, once a thriving mountain town, can be described as nothing more than a ghost town, one with literal ghosts at that. Garnet is the most well-preserved ghost town in Montana. An economic boom in the 19th century, as gold mines and silver mines were uncovered, saw the population massively swell, the town grew, and the numbers came pouring in. That is, at least, until the 1940s, when the mines had been exhausted. Once again, Garnet housed a small population as the hustle and bustle filtered out. Today, if you stop by Garnet, the only people you will see are tourists and volunteers. Volunteers give tours, sell souvenirs, and lend a helping hand towards maintenance. The U.S. Bureau of Land Management selects who the lucky few will be, as they enjoy a break away from modern civilization, no electronics, no Wi-Fi, no running water. That being said, volunteers do enjoy a cabin that's nestled in the area. Ranger Nakoma Gainan described the town as primitive but explained the volunteer system is for the outdoorsy types, stating, 
There are trails to explore, artifacts to inspect. However, the history of the town has become only half the reason to visit Garnet. Some have suggested that the spirits and the presence of the former residents come to life in the evenings and the winter months. Garnet has been victim to reports of a piano being played in the night and the melody sounding from a building presumed empty. Reports of unearthly noises and otherwise vague descriptions of visions and sounds that set one on edge. In the winter and autumn months, visitors have been known to describe people dressed in dated clothing, old-fashioned and somewhat transparent. There are footprints seen in the snow entering buildings, but never any going in the opposite direction, regardless as to how long ago the snow last began to fall. Some report a woman simply staring from the upstairs room window at the Garnet Hotel. Ellen Baumler, a ghost whisperer with the Montana Historical Society, commented, They cause no trouble and anyone who visits the deserted town in the mid of winter should be prepared to meet them. She goes on to explain that the ghostly activity within Garnet is no secret and that these entities are known throughout the area, saying that any historian researching the town is well aware of this. Despite the locals all being clued in on the town's ghostly history, the website only shines a light on the snapshot of American history preserved within the town and does not mention any signs of paranormal guests. Would you dare to visit Garnet? And would you rent a cabin in winter when the past residents are said to really come to life? Artificial intelligence could not crack the code. In 2018, artificial intelligence endeavoured to figure out the 600-year-old code, though even the AI could not reliably figure out what this code said. The Voynich manuscript appears to contain between 25 and 30 characters, as interpretations have been varied and is written from left to right by a single hand. It is made up of 102 parchment folios, meaning it reaches approximately an astounding 234 pages in length. This objective information is minimal and does not necessarily aid in solving the mystery as to the original language the manuscript was written in. The manuscript is written in an unidentified language, using an alphabet that has not been seen elsewhere prior to the manuscript's discovery or after it was found. Many believe it has been written using a substitution cipher. This involves the letters of an existing language being exchanged for made-up letters to create a code. Typically, a substitution cipher is considered the simplest code and is one of the oldest methods of encrypting a text. If it really is such a simple code, then why haven't scientists been able to translate the manuscript? Scientists have no idea what the original language is to begin figuring out where the substitutions have been made. Bradley Hauer and Gregor Kondrak aimed to use computational analysis in order to find a country the text may have originated from or a language it was written in. Numerous algorithms were trained to pick up the statistical fingerprints of the text and compare it to existing established languages to attempt to find a match. Factors such as the frequency of each letter and combinations of letters were used. Hauer and Kondrak began using this software on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. They input 380 languages. This trial appeared to work and be successful, so they moved forward with their research. A computational linguist at Illinois Institute of Technology stated that the results were in debate, but not more so than many other results often published in the scientific literature. The next step in their artificial intelligence testing and research was for Kondrak and Hauer to apply these algorithms to the infamous Voynich manuscript. But this was where the pair began to encounter numerous issues. The initial obstacle is that the algorithm was trained to trace modern languages. The evolution of languages regarding vocabulary, grammar, syntax and spelling is massive and so languages we use today are incredibly different to the same languages in the late medieval or early modern societies which is when the manuscript was traced back to in the 15th century. Another problematic element of the AI research is that while suggestions are made for the closest matches, the probability of this being a match is not considered. Kondrak and Hauer claimed to have discovered the source language, Hebrew, through their algorithm. However, this was the closest match of the 380 languages they inputted, but was not a certain match. 
Other matches that were considered close, for example Malay, are drastically different from Hebrew, and so the validity of this algorithm may be deemed very low. The lack of evaluation regarding how likely each language is means that Hebrew may have been the closest match available, but not necessarily similar enough to the source language for a substitution code. The final hurdle, and perhaps the factor that is a deal-breaker in the validity of their research, is that Kondrak and Hauer suggested the Voynich manuscript is written using not only a substitution cipher, but that it was also written in anagrams, having the letters within each word jumbled up too. Whilst this has been suggested before, it is certainly not a proven fact, just a theory. Kondrak and Hauer used Google Translate, which has a reputation for forcing nonsensical words and phrases into coherent fluent sentences. Despite all the indicators that their work should be and would be disregarded, Kondrak and Hauer claimed the first sentence of the Voynich manuscript to be as follows. She made recommendations to the priest, man of the house, and me and people. The sensationalist media headlines stated that the Voynich manuscript had been deciphered and translated. And while we may have been drawn closer, the flawed methodology of Kondrak and Hauer's work means the translation holds little weight. Maybe future artificial intelligence can solve this mystery, but for now, we still don't know. The mysterious plants, codes and astronomical signs that feature in the book Perhaps even more puzzling than the mysterious Voynich language appears to be written in are the bizarre illustrations, doodles and diagrams that accompany the unknown writing. Images included in the manuscript depict strange plants, astrological diagrams, castles, dragons and perhaps the most puzzling image, an unclothed woman in what appears to be a bath. While some outlandish theories suggest ancient water park designs, Others suggest medicinal information or even alien technology. One theory, posed by Dr. Cheshire, a linguist at Bristol University, suggested it was a manual covering relationships and parenting, written in a code based off of a proto-romantic language. Dr. Cheshire believes it aligns with the Catholic and Roman pagan beliefs held by many Mediterranean Europeans in the 15th century. Dr. Cheshire states that he believed the Voynich manuscript was written by Dominican nuns. Bristol University commented, following media coverage, concerns have been raised about the validity of this research, and went on to ensure it is known that Dr. Cheshire's work is not affiliated with the university. However, perhaps the most common guess is that the Voynich manuscript details medical information. Medicine in the early modern and medieval periods contained lots of myths. Herbal remedies were common, explaining the plant diagrams, and many believed there was a correlation between the position of the stars and individuals' health, hence zodiac images being included. Furthermore, a bath was thought to cure many illnesses, explaining the image of the unclothed woman bathing. This suggests that health and medicine is a common factor between a fair few of the illustrations in the Voynich manuscript. The medicinal theory has been suggested by many, one of whom is historian Nicholas Gibbs in 2017. He offered the suggestion that the images centered health for the reasons just mentioned, but also that the manuscript was a pseudoscientific women's health manual. He, like many others, claimed to have solved the code, and believed the absurdly complex codes were Latin abbreviations, and that the Voynich manuscript was written in common shorthand that would have been understood in the 15th century, and was not code that needed to be broken. His work was heavily criticised and ultimately discredited because Nicholas Gibbs either reiterated ideas people before him had suggested and his own theories, the translated sentences, made little to no grammatical sense in Latin. The dismissal of Nicholas Gibbs's research ultimately means the contents of the Voynich manuscript remain a mystery. But the bizarre images seem to have an underlying theme. The Voynich manuscript appears to be split into seven distinct sections botanical, containing imagery of herbs and plants, astronomical, with pictures such as the sun, moon and stars, cosmological, illustrated with circular geometric designs, the zodiac section, containing drawings of the zodiac signs, biological, which has depictions of unclothed women in various baths, pharmaceutical, with images of containers and herbs side by side, 
And finally, the recipe section, which contains no illustrations, merely lines of text with stars in the margin. These theories are simply based upon where certain images lie within the text. As of today, the manuscript remains a mystery. The more time that passes, the more speculation and rumours continue to grow, and every few years we can be sure someone new will step forward announcing that they have found a new translation. But with so many experts eager to add to the research, such claims are often quickly refuted. Great minds are puzzled by the nature of the Voynich manuscript. The Cold War saw the involvement of the FBI, fearing it was a coded form of communist propaganda, and still no solution or understanding was found. Will we ever figure out this impossible code? Arguably the world's most mysterious book, allegedly figured out over and over, and still nobody can read it. Linguists, historians and cryptographers have puzzled over it for centuries and will continue to do so until we solve this mystery. What lies within the Voynich Manuscript? An angel saves a dying daughter. It is difficult to believe things that are beyond our imagination. The word of mouth isn't the best evidence in our contemporary society and even photographic proof is doubted but every so often a video appears that takes the world by storm. In this case, a teenage girl by the name of Chelsea Banton, aged 15, had a fatal case of pneumonia, laying in a hospital bed as the life faded from her eyes. Her condition kept worsening until the doctors decided that the time had come to take her off life support. The moment that her loved ones surrounded her to say their farewells, the nurses in charge of security cameras began to panic. Ms. Banton, Chelsea's mother, rushed to see what was going on. The monitors revealed an astonishing white light that appeared to be an angel, which stood by Chelsea's hospital room. Chelsea's mother immediately prayed that this was an angel coming to save her daughter from her sickness or to deliver her to heaven if her time had come. Ms. Banton took a photograph of the monitor and within minutes a miracle happened. Chelsea, who was so close to passing away, was restored. Her health returned to her on swift wings. The family was convinced that this was a blessed act of God that he sent an angel to protect Chelsea from passing away. However, it's challenging to determine whether this theory is accurate or whether it can even be considered real at all. In the past, humans had a tendency to blindly believe whimsical things with little evidence but we live in a society focused primarily on logic and science. Still, miracles happen every day, many of which cannot easily be explained by the reasoning science offers because we still know far too little. The unknown will always exist, and the more answers we gather, the more questions we'll have. Did an angel save Chelsea Banton, or was it a mere coincidence? If it wasn't an angel, what else could it have been? How could she have suddenly got better after being so frail? Could this really have been something divine? Ivona Wisorek It was the 17th of July 2010 in Spot, Poland. In the early morning light, 19-year-old Ivona Wisorek makes a final call to her friend Adria. Earlier that night, the girls were out celebrating their completion of high school attending a party not far from their home. Adria convinced Avona to leave and to continue their partying at a nearby nightclub, Dream Club. Not long after midnight, they arrived at the club, along with three of Adria's male friends, Paul, Adrian and Mark. After an argument with the men, Ivona stormed out, determined to walk the almost four miles home. Texts from her phone indicate she was angry her friend did not follow her out of the club after the argument. There were several calls made to Adria. The last one occurred at around 4am, in which Adria had apologised for the incident at the club. Ivona confessed she wasn't in a state to be seen at home, still drunk from all the partying. Adria informed Ivona she would leave her keys outside of her apartment if she wanted to come to stay with her. CCTV easily tracked Ivona's path, having been seen on several different cameras. Barefoot and alone, she headed towards the neighbourhood that she and Adria lived in. Needless to say, Ivona never arrived. Later that day, 
After awakening and finding her keys where she had left them, Adria contacted Ivona's family to check that she had made it home. Although she was reported missing, authorities claimed Ivona was capable enough to make it home and could have stayed at another friend's house. It was a week before the disappearance of Ivona was taken seriously. During the last few seconds of the video captured of Ivona, a man was seen walking behind her. He was possibly the last known person to see her alive. Even though his picture and sketches were widely circulated, no one ever stepped forward claiming to be the man. And he was never identified. In 2014, Adria and one of the men from the club were interviewed regarding the disappearance. Although both of them corroborated the time Ivona left the club, neither of them could maintain eye contact with the camera. And though they seemed to remember the time of her leaving, not one of them could remember what the argument was about. This strange behaviour has led some to believe that perhaps Adria and the men know more about her disappearance than they were telling. In Poland, Ivona's disappearance has not faded away. Some 12,000 pages on a forum remain active searching for Ivona, sharing pictures of her and asking for someone to step forward. Some fear she has been sold into human trafficking. Even with hundreds of people from the area interviewed, no sign of Ivona has ever turned up. The Black Mountain Known as Kalkajaka by the indigenous peoples living there, Black Mountain has its fair share of haunted stories and legends. This mountain is situated along the Trefethen Range in northern Queensland. It is made up of many giant granite boulders. Kalkajaka translates to spear and was named for the last battleground between the inland and coastal clans as they fought for hunting grounds. It is a massive graveyard for their fallen warriors and is believed to be a place where devils and spirits wander about. The indigenous peoples in this area are taught to respect the mountain and actively avoid going there. They believe that you will get very sick if you visit it and that the spirits living there will torment you. The legends say that there are dark forces at work within the mountain, so they do not like when people visit it. Once settlers started arriving to colonize the lands in the 1800s, they also added onto these legends with their own experiences. Dozens of men have attempted to visit the mountain, but none ever made it back. Men, their horses, and entire herds of cattle have gone missing from this mountain. Infamous criminals ran into the mountain and caves to escape law enforcement and were never found, despite intensive searches of the surrounding areas. Even the trackers that were sent in to find missing people also disappeared. There was only one case of a police officer who returned, but he was so distraught and unhinged that he was unable to ever give a report on it. It is nicknamed the Bermuda Triangle of Northern Queensland, as no one can fully explain what happens there. People who live nearby report eerie sounds that occur, especially during the night. When the wind blows through the rocks, it sounds like people or spirits screaming. When it rains and the rocks break down and fall, it sounds as if an explosion has just gone off. Some theories say that it is a man-made pyramid as it is located on one of the meridian points on our planet. In reality, it is just hard granite that was formed underneath the Earth's surface and was gradually exposed as the surface above it eroded. Weather shaped the rock into boulders and created deep fractures and cliffs. The dark colour of the rock is also due to the blue-green algae that grows on it. Despite knowing how the rocks were formed, there is still no concrete explanation for all the missing persons. It is an extremely dangerous hike to get to the top of the mountain. It requires you to jump from rock to rock where any misstep can cause you to fall. The indigenous people dislike it when adventurers come to hike the mountain as they don't show any respect for it. If you want to visit it, you should take a guided tour led by the indigenous clans so that they can teach you about the cultural significance of it. Most people don't believe in the spirits that haunt the mountain, but they are still wary of the mountain. Some superstitions cannot be ignored. There is just something about Black Mountain that unnerves people. Joe Pitchler This American child star had a bright future ahead of him. Joe Pitchler disappeared on January 5th, 
2006, aged only 18. Born into a family of five, Pitchler spent his formative years in Los Angeles chasing his young acting dreams, having begun acting at only four years old. As a child, he accomplished several notable roles in TV shows and in movies such as the Beethoven franchise and films like Children on Their Birthdays and Varsity Blue. Pitchler returned to his hometown of Bremerton, Washington in 2003 because his family wanted him to live near them. He graduated high school in Bremerton in 2005, after which he allegedly planned on continuing his ambitions and returning to LA. Pitchler took his acting career seriously, publicly straying from substances. He had dreams of being a movie star as young as 14 years old, knowing precisely what he wanted in life, which was to someday win an Oscar. Despite living in his hometown, Joe Pitchler lived alone on the other side of town from the rest of his family. Friends who claim to have seen Pitchler last say he was in good spirits when he spent time with them right before he vanished. Pitchler's car, a 2005 Toyota Corolla, was discovered several days later. His family reported him missing 11 days after his disappearance. The last call from his phone was said to have gone out at 4.08 a.m. to one of his friends who claimed he visited earlier. Joe's family say they found a letter in his car but refused to categorize it as a note of taking one's life. The letter allegedly mentioned Pitchler's desire to have his belongings given to his younger brother and that he wanted to be a stronger brother. The case lead detective stated, There's a good indication that it might have been suicide, but we don't know that. There was no suspicion of foul play involved, despite his family's belief otherwise, who are convinced he would not have taken his life. His case has frustrated detectives for over two decades, with no conclusion in sight. By all means, it seems Joe Pitchler dissipated into thin air without a single trace. His mother stated about his move from LA to Washington, I just wanted him to have some normalcy in his life. He's a good boy and took it well, but he wasn't really happy about it. His brother Matthew believes he wanted to start over, whilst his mother argues there was no goodbye in regard to her dismissal of the note as to him taking his own life. His family additionally stated that his apartment door was unlocked and the lights were on, which they found greatly unusual. The police, despite the family's insistence on something amiss, chalked it up to Pitchler jumping from a nearby bridge. His mother recalls, he said, I don't know how to say this to you without sounding really bad. But basically, I think your son's dead and it could take months for him to show up in the water. But this claim was heavily opposed by the detectives who retorted they were keeping an open mind regarding scenarios of what might have happened to him, but that they had doubted the theory of foul play. The family believed the police did not work hard enough. Kathy, Pitchler's mother, claims the police have not fingerprinted his car. They sifted through it. They were in his apartment for about three minutes. They've done nothing. Hundreds of people attempted to assist in the search for Pitchler, coming to Bremerton after the disappearance was reported, but not a single person found any sign of him. Since 2006, there have been no leads or clues as to what became of Joe Pitchler. It is unknown whether he is still alive or deceased, and why was his car abandoned, or what he was doing at the time of his vanishing, but his body has never been found. The Disappearance of Bart Schleyer Bart Schleyer was an avid outdoorsman and had completed a master's degree in wildlife biology. After he finished his degree, Bart worked for Fish and Game and the interagency Grizzly Bear Study Team in Montana. His job, along with the rest of his team, was to study grizzly bears' reaction to coming across humans in the wild. During his research, he would camp out in the wilderness for sometimes months at a time. On these trips, he would pack meat as grizzly bait and cable used for foot snares. Bart Schleyer practically lived outdoors, always wanting to study and be in the wilderness. He would use bow and arrows and was very experienced as a whole. The 14th of September 2004 was Bart Schleyer's last known contact with a float plane that had dropped him off in Canada's Yukon Territory. For this trip, Bart left carrying enough food for two weeks, an inflatable raft and camping equipment. Two weeks later, the same plane returned to pick Bart up, but he wasn't there. After being officially reported missing on the 30th of September, the Royal Canadian Mountain Police initiated a full-scale search and rescue, but didn't find Schleyer. 
Only some food at his camp and his inflatable raft was found half a mile away from his campsite. With the weather turning severe in the area, the police believed Bart hiked up to the nearby highway. After this disappointing conclusion, a friend of Bart Schleyer, Dib Williams, and pilot Wayne Curry decided to fly out to the camp after the search was over to investigate further. They then found Bart's tent along with his backpack, radio, bear repellent, and a knife. Not believing that Schleyer would leave all this equipment behind and getting more worried for Schleyer's well-being, Williams, accompanied by Warner Curry, set out the next day to continue their search. After finding Schleyer's bow and arrows and a camouflage face mask with blood on, they decided to call the Royal Canadian Mountain Police back to search the area and investigate further. The police, as well as Yukon conservation officers and other volunteers, ventured back to the area on the 3rd of October. Around 60 metres or so from the location the bow and arrow was found, some clothing, a camera and part of a skull were found. The skull was identified as that of Bart Schleyer, though no more of his body was found. Grizzly bear droppings found in the immediate vicinity led to the theory that Schleyer was the victim of a grizzly bear attack. However, conflicting opinions and lack of clothing found with bone fragments in the droppings, the fact that bears usually bury kills and no sign of a struggle led to skepticism of a bear attack being the cause. In addition, those who knew him believed he was too experienced in the wilderness to be caught off guard, and the fact that if it was a bear attack, his nearby camp would likely have been raided by the bear for food too. Furthermore, bears normally go for the head when attacking people and no tooth marks were found on his skull. The Disappearance of Sharon Buis On May 23, 2014, Sharon Gay Buis disappeared from the Mount Roberts Trail in Alaska. She was last seen at 9.30am that morning at the Alaska Marine Line store in downtown Juneau. The 48-year-old was hiking solo and had not notified any friends or family about her plans. She was supposed to meet with a friend the next day at 8.45am to go hiking together, but failed to show. After some time, she was reported missing, but troopers have not found any clues of her whereabouts to this day. Sharon Buis was a physical therapist working for Genot Physical Therapy and had lived in Genot for a decade by the time of her disappearance. She also ran a side business where she sold orthopedic office chairs. She was shipping out two chairs at Alaska Marine Lines the day that she went missing. Buis was an experienced hiker and had recently returned from Greenland where she went ice camping. She had even biked from Alaska to Canada at one point and enjoyed running, kayaking and playing hockey. Buis was always active, so her longtime hiking partner was very confused when she did not show up that morning. Buis owned an emergency GPS, but left it at home that day along with her overnight backpack. Police assumed her cell phone was with her, but it was most likely turned off as the phone company could not ping its location. Ann Johnson called the police and filed a missing person report after Buis failed to show up for their Hawthorne Peaks hike. Feeling uneasy about the situation, Johnson drove around that evening to various trailheads looking for Buis's car. She eventually found it parked at Mount Roberts Trailhead at 9.30pm on May 24, 2014. The search began at 1am on May 25th and covered the entire Mount Genot trail system and backcountry over four days. The US Coast Guard, Alaska State Troopers, Southeast Alaska Dogs and the Alpine Club all joined the search and rescue alongside her family and friends. The Coast Guard even brought in a helicopter to use FLIR thermal imaging and night vision to find her, but were unsuccessful. The search team utilised aerial support wherever the ground was too dangerous for searchers to explore, such as ravines or ridgelines. A search dog picked up her scent near the Mount Roberts Trailhead parking lot after a few days. But that was it. The search lasted only four days before the state troopers called it off, much to the dismay of Buise's loved ones. The searchers had covered so much ground and double-checked everywhere that they were confident she was not there. Over the next few months, occasional leads would turn up and give them hope, such as a hiker who reported a bear and a decaying odour, but nothing ever panned out. Some groups conducted additional search attempts around the trail and the abandoned mine shafts nearby, but never found any evidence suggesting Buise's presence. 
They have combed through that trailhead so often that it is surprising they have not been able to find anything. The police and troopers explained that Buis might have gotten lost or injured in an area inaccessible to ground searchers. Another theory is that she was attacked by an animal, although they found no evidence of that. Another idea was that she was a victim of foul play. Her car was at the trailhead, but did she even make it up onto the trail? The police never managed to find information about Sharon Buis's disappearance, so it remains an open case seven years later. The Disappearance of Bruno Manza On May 25, 2000, Swiss environmentalist Bruno Manza disappeared in the Borneo forests and has never been seen since. He was declared legally deceased five years later as there was no sign or evidence of him found. He was 45 at the time and had spent the past 10 years fighting the Malaysian government and logging companies on behalf of the Penan, the indigenous jungle nomads of Borneo. Manza wanted to live a life without consumerism, capitalism and technological advancements. As a young adult, he refused the Swiss military draft and served a few months in jail. He then moved to the Alps to work as a cow and sheep herder and learned how to make his own tools and food. He became enchanted with this type of simple living. Switzerland was not enough for him, so at 30 years old he travelled to Borneo. He soon learned about the Penan nomadic tribes and decided to try and find them and live with them. After searching the dense Sarawak jungle in Malaysia, he finally came in contact with them in May 1984. After some time, the Penan accepted his presence and he began to learn their language and culture. He grew out his hair into their traditional mullet, wore a loincloth, walked barefoot and even hunted with a blow dart. The Penan nicknamed him Laki Penan, which means Penan Man. They respected him and considered him one of their own. The politics in Borneo grew more complicated and aggressive as the government backed the logging companies who were destroying the forests and desecrating sacred lands. The deforestation contaminated their drinking water, significantly reduced the vegetation and game, and limited the tribe in their movements. Mansa began to work alongside the Penan in their attempts to thwart the loggers. Over the next decade, he would go back almost every year to visit the tribe usually by illegally crossing the border out of Indonesia to get to them, and would assist them in their battle with the loggers. He travelled the world and held lectures, protests and strikes to garner attention to the Penan's plight. He set up a fund to give aid to the indigenous people in the forest, and the cause eventually gained notoriety around the world. Politicians and leaders around the world condemned the deforestation which angered the Malaysian government. They denied him entry and put a bounty on his head when he swam across the border at night. He was enemy number one of the state and escaped capture numerous times by using a fake passport and changing his appearance, running away while an officer was distracted and using the rivers and forest undergrowth to hide. In February of 2000, Mansa began his last trek to the Sarawak forest. He first travelled with the secretary of his fund, BMF, and a film crew. After a while, they left and he continued with a different friend for a few weeks until they arrived at the sarawak kalimantan border. Mansa, aided by a local guide, crossed the border on the 22nd of May. The last known sighting of him was on May 25th, when a local Penan and his son journeyed with him to the mountain Bukit Batu Lawi. Mansa intended to ascend the mountain alone. Searches and expeditions were conducted by Penan teams and members of the BMF, but to no avail. There were conspiracies that the Malaysian government ended his life, but those close to him believe he either fell down the mountain or took his own life. After his disappearance, he was awarded the International Society for Human Rights Prize and had a new species of goblin spider named after him. Ten years after his disappearance, a memorial service was held in Basel, Switzerland, to which 500 people attended. There have been films and books made about his story. The Strange Disappearance of Alfred Bielhartz 
It was a warm summer day in 1938 when the Beelharts family decided to go fishing at Estes Park, Colorado. They had been camping in the Rocky Mountain National Park over Independence Day weekend for their summer vacation. What they expected to be a lovely and fun family outing soon turned into a nightmare that they never woke up from. On July 3rd, 1938, at approximately 8 a.m., the youngest Bilhart's child, Alfred, mysteriously disappeared. The family was camping about a quarter mile west of the Fall River Lodge with family friends. The campsite was situated near Horseshoe Falls, where the Roaring River and Fall River intersect. That morning, the Bilhart's family made plans to go fishing. They were hiking together on a trail that ran alongside the Roaring River. As the trail they were hiking on was narrow, the family formed a single line as they walked. Little Alfred Bilharts was the youngest of ten children in the family. Only four years old at the time, Alfred made up the rear of the line. His parents and nine older siblings were all ahead of him, so no one noticed when he fell behind the group and vanished. After realizing he disappeared, his family desperately searched the area for him. Unsuccessful, they anxiously called in the park rangers for assistance. Ranger Moomore at the Fall River Ranger Station immediately contacted the Civilian Conservation Corps, a work relief program implemented by President Roosevelt's New Deal. Over a hundred CCC members showed up to help in the search and rescue. The rangers assumed he had fallen and drowned in the creek, so they focused their search there. They dammed the creek by setting up sandbags, rocks, logs and even a fence with barbed wire, but nobody turned up. They also dragged the river for almost six miles, as there was no way for his body to have been carried downstream past all the searches and obstructions, the rangers stopped searching the river. There was a potential sighting of him by fellow hikers in the National Park. On Sunday, July 3rd, William J. Eels and his wife were hiking up the old Fall River Road. While taking a break, they looked up at Mount Chaplin and saw a young boy sitting on a ledge along the mountainside. According to the couple, he made a loud noise before either abruptly leaving or being pulled back. This section of the mountain was six miles west and almost 3,000 feet higher in elevation from where Alfred had vanished from. The couple reported this to the rangers a day later, but nothing was found by the time investigators arrived. Alfred's parents were convinced that he had been abducted. They argued that he would never just walk off and leave his family, and they were very doubtful that he had fallen into the creek. The searchers moved their focus onto land and brought in bloodhounds, but to no avail. They picked up a few scents, but quickly lost them at a fork in the path and at the water. After ten days, the search was eventually called off. There were hoax ransoms and a claimed sighting of him with a man in Nebraska, but no concrete leads. 82 years later, Alfred Bilharts is still missing. His case is no longer being investigated. But what do you make of these mysteries and disappearances? Be sure to let us know your thoughts in the comment section below and help us by growing this community while working to solve these unexplained mysteries. Thank you for watching and don't forget to subscribe for more videos.